So we'll begin with the teacher-student prayer. <clears throat> Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavahai Tejasvina Vaditam Mastoma Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 May that one protect us both, may that one nourish us both. May we work together with great energy. May our study be illumined. May we not unnecessarily cover with each other. <clears throat> peace, peace, peace beyond all. Uh, so uh, as usual, I'll mute the microphone and take any of your questions. One question is already up there in the chat, which we can deal with. But just in case there are any others. So I think the question is there for everyone to see. My question is how to react to situations or people with whom we go to a lower, to lower self. Vedanta says to see God in everyone. I'm not sure if I fully understand your question. Maybe you could expand on it. Are you happy to do that on microphone? Yes, Swamiji. Um, Pranam Swamiji. Um, so my question is, in the day-to-day -day life, uh, when we try to uh, not try, when we practice Viveka and Vairakya continuously, but still, you know, the worldly matters uh, pull us down to the lower self, like uh, either the situations or the people, uh, to keep that Shraddha there, like how to react to these situations or avoid these situations, um, yeah, that is my uh, question, Swamiji. Like when uh, Vedanta says to see the divine in everyone, like how do we react to people or the situations which don't go with that? So, of course, uh, I've given everybody a formula, uh, which I describe as the four R's, and I could go through that. But before I go through that, uh, maybe I could uh, pick up on some of the way you're phrasing it. So it's not that there is a law in Vedanta that says we have to see the divine in everyone. It's not a law like that. Although in the Upanishads, we find it. We find it there in the Isha Upanishad. We find it in the Bhagavad Gita. We find it in so many places. We find it in the Katu Upanishad. And it is a basic formula. But the formula is based on how we normally view the world and how we could or should view it in order to ease our difficulty and our pain. And sometimes we think of these uh, issues in a dogmatic way that, yes, we have to, and we don't understand what is the reason for it, but let us examine the reasons. Of course, we think that we live in a divided world where there are individual objects, where there are individual uh, places in space, individual situations, and individual people who can either be on our side or give us problems. And then we have other situations. When we say Shanti, Shanti, Shanti three times, it's because we understand uh, how, we, how we can uh, uh, assess and deal with difficulties. So one difficulty is caused by us. But we don't think about that because we impulsively react in a such a way that we don't think of the longer term consequences of it. And yet, of course, they will be there, not just longer term, but immediate term you know, or future, in future consequences. And future could mean a few seconds afterwards, or it could mean a few years after it, or a few lifetimes after it. We have no way of knowing. The universe has its own way of arranging and rearranging things. The second thing is that there are situations, awkward situations caused by others. 
And we normally have not much control of that other than learning to deal with things in a diplomatic way, in a loving way. And then thirdly, there are just things that happen. The universe is called Prakriti. That's the Sanskrit word for it. There are two terms we can use, Jagat. Jagat means the thing that always changes. And something that always changes is not predictable necessarily. Of course, there's a causation law that goes with it, and we can predict some of those things, but there's also indeterminism. Things just happen, they happen randomly, unexpectedly, or seem to happen unexpectedly. The, this time in the last century, we would have already been through a world war, which would have cost easily 10 million lives and more. And so in 1914, when this war broke out, Great War as it's called, nobody could ever think that there would be anything that goes beyond a few months, but it went on for some four years and cost many, many needless lives. So we have to take these three things into account. And what is the philosophy behind it? How can we handle such things? Well, the first cause we can handle. And we handle it by making sure that we uh, view the world in a proper way. You mentioned Viveka, you mentioned Vairagya, but what does it mean? It means that we have to try to value the world in its most real and truthful aspect. And Vedanta's highest conclusion is that there is only one existence. I was having a conversation on Sunday and I told people there an interfaith event. I said, you see, our system of philosophy, the philosophy of Hinduism that we call Vedanta, um, is not just monotheistic, it is more than that, it's monistic. And more accurately, it's non-dualistic. Non-dualistic means it's beyond number. There are just no two things. And if there are no two things, whatever, in every sense, in the sense of one energy, in the sense of one mind, in the sense of one material existence, and in the sense of one spirituality or one spirit, and then when you get caught up with numerology, you have a difficulty. Because if you say monistic, if you say one, the implication is, well, there may be two or three or four. So the best description is to say non-dualistic. There are absolutely no two things. But that's not what our senses register. So we have to modify our position a little bit and say, all right, well, if we accept these all these fragments and individualities. Let us see if we can have a practice a penetrating vision that sees only the oneness. Mm -hmm. And we try to cultivate that as much as we possibly can. And of course, <clears throat> so scripture helps in this. Scripture meaning uh, the experience of the reality, the unchanging reality as seen by those who have seen such a thing an internal kind of internal vision. So we have to learn to cultivate a penetrating vision that says there is only one thing, there is only one energy. There's not multiple energies. There are not bad energies, not good energies. Only one energy is there and it is divine energy. Now, if we have are absolutely convinced of that through convincing arguments based on modern science, based on scripture, based on common sense, based on meditation, meditative realization of it, then our faith in it will increase. And our faith, therefore, in the goodness of everything around will also increase. And what we mean by faith, we mean absolute unwavering conviction, absolute trust. We don't have to look at it a second time. This is discernment or discrimination. This is Viveka constantly seeing the world as it is. Viveka is sometimes used as a, a system where we eliminate things. Not this, not that, not this, not that. What is permanent? It was not this and it's not that. It was only one side of the story. The other side is that there is this oneness that seems to be flowing through in and as the diversity. 
like, and the old example is, like the sun, with its various conditioning, looking like rainbow colors to our vision, and understanding our limitation of understanding, and feeling the glory about it. So <clears throat> then, Vairagya, we don't have to worry about, because automatically, that level of detachment happens by itself. And if we then add a loving attitude, that is, if we see and feel the divine within everything, then that becomes paramount. It becomes our paramount love, which means all the other little loves fall away by themselves. You know, when you walk toward uh, the peak of the mountain, you're automatically leaving the, the rest of the pathway behind. You don't have to renounce it. It's already happening. So that's a useful concept to have. Then we have to watch, and that watch is really a game of guiding thought. The watchfulness means that we have the ability to see what reactions are taking place, but we also have to have some common sense about it. So if there are awkward situations and difficult people, so-called, that uh, provoke us into a sense of anger or a sense of reactive sense, if possible, it's much better to avoid those situations and those people. If we can. This is just common sense. If we said to an alcoholic, please, just don't visit any pubs and don't have any alcoholic drink. Well, it's common sense to give that advice. And I don't think we need to spell it out. Now, if it's not possible, if we are thrust into these circumstances, then we really have to have this conviction that the whole of life is a game where we have to be astutely watchful and skillful in our behavior. And this is where we come across the four R's. So let me go through these. The first thing that we notice in the mental field is our own reaction. It comes up. Can't stop it. Where is it coming from? It's coming from the unconscious area, our library of experiences that say, when this happens, this reaction has to take place. It's an old behavior and generally not very useful to us because there's no thinking involved in it. Now you see every animal has this, this immediate reactivity. We have to label it instinct, but it's a learned behavior. When I'm under attack, then I defend. When my life is in danger, then I fight. Now, the mammalian experience, that is mammals and even more than mammals, will, will do more than that. They will not only defend their own life, they'll defend the continuation of their life, in other words, the genetic ancestry, that is, children, offspring, they'll defend that. And the maternal instinct in animals will, will do that probably more. But when you say going down to a lower level, does it mean that we are just subject to the normal sort of genetic love that every biological species seems to go through? Or is there some higher dimension to us? Well, clearly there is, because we have an intellect and we're able to sort things out, think for ourselves. We're able to write poetry, we're able to paint exquisite pictures, we're able to enjoy art and culture and music, and we're able to do scientific understanding where we try to investigate what the world is about and speak in the language of mathematics and equations and make it highly comprehensible to those who are trained in those areas. So we are appealing to some kind of higher sense of perfection on the one hand, and on the other hand, we're using a highly tuned intellect, a high power of reasoning, where we're able to control. Imagine now the whole universe. We don't know how big the universe is, I don't know. 90 billion years across or something like that, they estimate, but that's just the observable universe. And when we get to its border, it's likely to go on and on and on. We don't know. 
We only know according to our speed limit, speed of light, and that's it. So now imagine in this vast area, as it were, in all directions, calculated to be, I don't know, let's say 100 billion galaxies containing each, containing 100 billion stars and odd, then where is my little problem? And where am I in this? Now there are two sides to this. First of all, there's a diminution of our importance. But on the other hand, there's an escalation because we are able to develop James Webb Telescope and other sophisticated equipment and investigate and go far, far back, as far back as the instrument will allow us. And we're looking back in terms of time. We're looking backwards in time. So we've figured out many things over the years. And uh, we, much of that learning has been on the shoulders of giants as well. And if you were to say who is more clever, is it Einstein or Newton? We'd have to say Newton because Newton didn't have predecessors to develop his thoughts from, and Einstein did. So this is where we are, the sophisticated human machine that is capable of higher values, higher sentiments, and it's inexplicable in terms of biology. Biology doesn't cover it, it doesn't explain it. And the only thing we say is this is natural growth. It is going from our internal perfection and discovering it by unfolding our discovery. So we are in a process of discovery. And part of that discovery will be to understand that whatever we think, no matter what the thought is, whether it's classified as good or bad, useful or not, whether it is, has a virtue in it or a vice in it, whatever thought comes out, will have its effect, its immediate effect on the whole. Why is it? Because there's only this oneness. And there are some people call the butterfly effect. Some butterfly in South America does this, uh, float, uh, flits its wings, and then there's a weather change on the other side, a little bit of an exaggeration. But the point is, we are living in a holistic world. There are no separations. They seem to be like that, but the truth is there are no separations. Love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Your neighbor is yourself. Don't go and attack. Your right hand doesn't go and attack your left hand. You wouldn't even think about, about doing it. Supposing the right hand was an independent entity and had weapons of its own, you wouldn't dream of attacking your chest or your hand because it's an idea. It's the same entity, even though it's different parts. And we have to have that absolute conviction. And when we have that absolute conviction, there is a reason then why our thoughts should be noble. But there's another reason, a more valid reason, a deeper reason. If there's only that one entity, that one thing which is there, well, then the highest value would be love. There's no value higher than love. And we would have a love for this. Where does this love come from? It comes from the recognition that there's an ever-flowing, ever-giving entity that continues to flow. And when we notice it, this is also called viveka, discrimination, discernment. Seeing that there's a flow of divine grace flowing through, all these fragments, and we can catch it like a surfer catching the crest of a wave, and we can enjoy it. And we can find joy in it. We can find glory in it. We can feel uplifted by it. So if we're forced into an unpleasant, what we register as an unpleasant situation, and if we're forced into the company of people who are awkward, at least we should register our own reactions about it. And we should register the fact that there's no reason why that person's eyes should shine or why their voice should be used or why the, the, there's an entity that digests their food and repairs their individual cells and provides them with air for breathing, except that there is a loving investor there. And when we look behind that, when we look at that, then, there's a shift in our understanding and attitude. 
we're not listening to what the person says. We're not reacting to what is in front of us. We are playing with a great, great skill, a wonderful game. And we start off by registering what is happening in the mental field. What is our first reaction? And we can't block it. First reaction will be first reaction, it'll come. But then it comes in a framework of time, which means the next blank, the next opportunity is a blank. It's a blank space. And we can use that and the next one and the next one and the next one and put some positive value in it. And that then is called, well, first of all, we can review it if we want to really analyze it. So we can react and then we can review, where did this come from? Well, there's no doubt it came from childhood or something like that. It came from previous experience. It came from an automatic knee jerk reaction that any biological species would have, maybe in a slightly more sophisticated way. So we have to adopt a philosophy. What's my way of saying it? We say to these old friends that come out, these first initial reactions, come if you like, come if you want. I won't block you. Stay if you can, have a cup of tea. But please go. And go as soon as you possibly can. Once you finish your tea, there's the door. Please go because I'm awaiting brand new friends that I want to invite for tea as well values of truth and beauty and goodness and harmony and peace and love and radiance and joy all these friends i want to bring in in such a way that they dominate the mind and form a habit as such a habit that completely outshines all the other negative habits that might have been useful to me in childhood but are no longer valid to me because i've outgrown them Anger, you have to outgrow. Jealousy, you have to outgrow. Pride, you have to outgrow. Retribution and vengeance, you have to outgrow. Fear, you have to outgrow. Doubt, you have to outgrow. Hate and dislike, you have to outgrow. It's a question of maturity. And the thing about growth is, you can't force it. You have to be patient with it. You can't force a flower to grow three centimeters in a day. It's not possible. Nature has an internal growth mechanism within it, and growth always happens from within. And within you is a natural growth, a natural seed in you that wants to manifest itself. And despite the fact of our ignorance and our misunderstandings and all our, you know, supposedly uh, unfortunate habits, put it that way, in spite of that, still there's a growth from within. And when I say within, not just within you, but within the whole of nature, nature itself provides the opportunities for growth. A tree does not grow unless there's carbon in the atmosphere, unless the photons in the rays of the sunshine, unless there is nutrients, unless there are suitable nutrients in the soil, unless there is this great skill for photosynthesis. Otherwise, none of this happens. So where is it coming from? And if you're talking of a tree, what was there before the tree? You might say a seed. What was there before a seed? Well. There was an inner essence, and that inner essence we call the divine essence. And that divine essence is within us. And when we nurture it, as we would nurture a seed, it grows and develops. And that means that we have to have absolute faith in the process of growth, and absolute faith in all the resources that are enabling this growth, in scripture, in teacher, in uh, in, in uh, the, the milestones that we come across, you review li your life and you'll find extremely useful milestones. And you can look back, let's say divide your life into decades. You look past uh, at the last 10 years and you'll see wonderful, wonderful gateways, wonderful opportunities, wonderful open spaces through which divine glory has the opportunity to flow through. 
and we become thankful for this. And this is part of the causation law as well. Now, if somebody is particularly difficult or a circumstance is particularly difficult, then we do have resources for it. Mantra is a resource. And I know, for example, somebody who was whose whole business and livelihood and everything was in danger in Zimbabwe. And uh, so they were, I gave them a, a mantra, it happened to be the mantra rang, which represents the fundamental element of fire. And we can imagine the fire protecting one, and it is all divine fire. There's nothing else except the divine. And by tuning into that, you become protected and rescued, you know. So there are many, many things at our disposal, but the fundamental element that we have to have is we have to have faith that we are where we are and we are where we should be. And the resources all around us, including our place of birth, our lineage, our genetic heritage, is exactly as it should be. And the position in which we find ourselves in terms of, say, work or relationships is exactly as it should be. Because this supreme divine that we are talking about is also an infuser of ideas. After all, it's a supreme thinker. All thoughts come from it. All ideas come from it. All knowledge comes from it. There's nothing that doesn't come from this flow of grace that we call the divine. And where do we get this faith? Because we can see it. We can witness it. If we have an eye to catch it, we will see firsthand how this divine grace flows through and gives us new opportunities and rescues us well. And the current of thought itself is such a gift. Why should we love this entity? Because it is love, because everything is delivered to us free of charge, in abundance. And thought is there. When we meditate, we don't meditate to get grace. We don't ask for grace. That would be not feasible because the act of thinking is the divine grace flowing through us. And how we steer it and direct us direct it, we have the freedom to do it ourselves. But there will always be consequences naturally. So these causations are there. Now, then the third R will be revaluation. We revalue it. We can see that this is not what we originally thought of. And no, and our first reaction may not have been the best reaction. So we learn to revalue not only the way we see the world and the earth and the circumstances, but we revalue it in a heightened way. That is, we see the glory in it. We see the ultimate divinity there. We see the Lord of the universe standing there. And when I say feel, think, I say and see, what I really mean is feel. It is a felt thing. So that as soon as we see somebody's eyes, we know it's not their individual eyes. The spark that we see there is called life. And that life is exactly divine. It is divine life. All life is divine life. So we had a discussion last night regarding good and evil. Should we not do something about evil? And my answer is, well, in a desperate circumstance, naturally, if you're cornered, you'll do something. But otherwise, leave it alone because we have enough to cope with in our own psyche in terms of dealing with our own uh, reactions that come out, uh, up, our own learned behavior, in other words, our own habit level, that has to be progressively supplanted by new values and new habits, positive habits. And the most supreme value in the whole of that would be love, unconditional love, all-embracing love, love that has no ends, love that is completely selfless, love that has no love of myself within it, only a love for the other, completely, totally, absolutely. And so uh, what is stopping it? 
what is stopping it on examination is the fact that we didn't see things properly, we didn't value things in the correct way. And when we see that and do that, we now have a chance to put in something of our own, something that is different. So react. We can't avoid it. We don't repress. Review. Find out where it came from. Revalue. Look at it in a more correct way, in a, in a more realistic way, in a non-emotional way, if you will, uh, from the impulsive emotion, if you will, from the lower values. And then lastly, replace it. Replace your original reaction with a new, a new action, a new action. Supposing somebody has done you a lot of harm. Well, you'd be very surprised at how they will react if the next time you see them, you walk up to them, put your arms around them, give them a hug, and thank them for their awkwardness. Well, not sarcastically, of course. <laughs> What a, ref what a reforming thing. It will completely take them by surprise. You know? And I can actually quote a real experience of mine. Uh, in, in Zimbabwe, you, there were some dangerous times, no doubt, in Zimbabwe. And one incident, uh, there was uh, myself and another passenger in a car, and we were kind of uh, ambushed, if you will, by a whole car full of armed people intending to do us some harm probably and knowing my philosophy practical philosophy i got out of my car mainly to protect the passenger walked straight toward them and casually asked them you know hello politely reverently you know something along the lines of hi guys how are you you know is there any problem, difficulty? Is there something I can help you with? We completely disarmed them psychologically. But these were people who had, in fact, cornered people, ambushed them, and shot them. And uh, so, and that was in all the newspapers and so on and so forth. They didn't do anything to me. They didn't expect that. We completely took them by surprise. But what is my attitude? Because along with it comes a certain element of fearlessness. Because it's only God standing there. <laughs> God alone is standing there. Nothing else is standing there. With that conviction, you walk toward that. A holistic attitude that says, there's only that oneness. And so last night we were discussing evil people and good people and so on and so forth. You may have your own judgment about that. But... He was without sin, cast the first stone, says Jesus, very wisely. If you have a small, see a small splinter in somebody else's eye, don't criticize that and try and remove it. Because you see, you may have a whole tree trunk in your own, a whole beam in your own eye. You take that out first. And when you adjust your own psychophysical unit, if you want to say that, then you will be a shining beacon, irresistible shining beacon. There'll be a magnetic personality about you that will create an aura. Now we understand recently it was Swami Vivekananda's birthday, and we happen to know when Swami Vivekananda walks into a room, nobody will challenge him, or you'd be a fool to do it, because he carries an aura with him, the way he stands, the way he walks, the way he relates, all of that, his absolute fearlessness. So on Swami Vivekananda's birthday, we had a puja here, and I gave a talk. I got everybody, please stand up. Now stand as straight as you possibly can. Now fold your arms like this. Now you're all Swami Vivekananda's, wonderful. Now sit down. You see how you stand, how you arrange your face, what inner feeling you have that naturally spills over because you are a walking, waking, living, localized magnetic field as part of the totality of electromagnetism. You are one energy. And people cannot resist you. Why? Because you are a powerhouse. 
when you concentrate your mind, you are a powerhouse, you are a force. And so this is called concentration. Concentration is a transforming thing, transforms your body, transforms your mind, and transforms your environment and the world around you. So cultivate that, knowing that you have the capacity to do it. Unasked and unthanked, this comes to you. You see, you may see remarkable personalities in the world, and you may be mistaken enough to think that these are mistakes or one-offs or freaks or, you know, I can never be like that. The sense of inadequacy. These people are such giants. I can never live up to that. I can never be that. Yes, you can. If it happens to one person, every person can attain that level. If Jesus had a certain wiring in him, we can develop the same wiring in us. If one person saw God, we can all see God. If one person understood the truth, we can all understand the truth. And we are inherently born to do it. Now, it is very rare to get a birth, a human birth. And this is emphasized by Shankaracharya and his Vivekeshudamani. That you see, very rare, after eons and eons and eons of births, you get this human birth. And if you're really lucky, you have multiple human births. Because this progress continues more and more and more. And unless you have a regression and drag the mind down to an irrevocable sense of regression, you'll continue moving forward. And so what you are now and your status quo now, this present moment is the result of all your activities in the past and the matching environment of your thought. And as I said last night at a small talk, is that there's nothing more powerful than thought. Thought is a creative, it's a creative molding element that manufactures all your world in front of you. And for that reason, we have to take care about our reactions. Now there's every practical merit in an awkward situation of taking time to go through these four hour hours. Because sometimes the situation catches you so off guard that you need time to regroup as it is. And there's the proverbial counting to 10, moving away from the situation, stabilizing your breathing and revaluing things and coming back to it. And when we do that, we may have a completely different view of the situation. And we can deal with it in a more level-headed, productive way. But if you drag yourself down to the level of somebody or a situation that provokes you, unfortunately, you're not going anywhere. But additionally, you're dragging yourself down and you're dragging the whole environment down with it. So, this is why the Bhagavad Gita in the sixth chapter tells us this very important and oft repeated quotation. See, you see, you can elevate your own mind or drag it down yourself. You're the one who's doing it, nobody else. You are your own best friend, you are your own worst enemy. It's entirely up to you. And so this is the great thing about your own individuality. Then, of course, if you treat it like a sport and find it difficult to have a sporting attitude, it means you don't consider it to be like a sport. And as I often say, there can be no more brutal sport, I suppose. Well, boxing is a brutal sport, but people still do it. Uh, but uh, the game of rugby is a brutal sport. It's a very physical and uh, you know, very uh, a, people get hurt from it. There's no doubt about it. But people still play it and enjoy playing it and take pride in playing it. And they may come up with broken noses and they may come up with cracked ribs and all kinds of things. But they still go on because they consider it is valuable 
for a sense of teamwork. It's valuable in order to exercise your physique. It's valuable if there is an opposition player, opposition players who are tough. And it is not valuable if there are no opposition players. If there's no opposition to you, it's not valuable. If there's no goal, it's not valuable. If there's no training, it's not valuable. If there's no repetition or practice, which we call training, it's not valuable. If, there, if there's no skill involved, it's not a game anymore. And you can see how many people train, train for marathon running, train for uh, all kinds of things, train in order to master skiing or paragliding or even intellectual sports such as chess, practicing it over and over again, the various moves that you might want to make and so on. And if you take life more seriously, then you have lost any idea of any possible purpose in it. Because it's a silly question to ask, what is the purpose of life? You can't point, you can't say, you can only say it is as it is. With those three factors, that there is your own input that has consequences, that there is input from others that has consequences. And finally, the nature of nature itself is irregular and surprising and therefore not boring. And we should learn to enjoy the process. So I don't know, there are two questions there and I don't know if I've answered both points. Second question that I'm seeing in the chat, how to increase the faith. Well, how do you increase any kind of conviction of any kind? There has to be a firm philosophical grounding from it. There has to be a review of all the milestones in the past to see that these were not accidents. These were all useful to us. There has to be faith in your own potential and ability, above all, above all else. The faith in your inner potential and the drive toward perfection the faith that you can do anything, anything at all. The whole key to yoga and its practice is that having mastered energy, you have mastered the entire universe. And that sounds outlandish and that sounds outrageous and that sounds impossible. And yet, the yogic science and modern science tells us exactly the same story that having mastered energy in one place, you've mastered it in every corner of the universe, everywhere. You literally become uh, omnipotent. If your basis is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, then this gives you unlimited scope everywhere. one of the great convincing aspects that makes Christianity credible to Christians are all kinds of the so-called miracles that Jesus did. A blind man sees, a lame man walks, a dead man awakens. Uh, people walk on water. People have visions. People look as if people experience a, a transformation, transformation effect. In a house crowded, and uh, a woman who is suffering from a hemorrhage touches the cloak of Jesus, and he says, "Who touched me? Why do you bother? People are pressing you. you want to get into the house and eat something? No, no. I felt. See, I felt some power being." withdrawn from me, as it were. And then it was discovered a woman touched the tassel of his cloak, and yes, her transformation take, it took place, her hemorrhage stopped, she was cured. Now, of course, the other stories in the Gospels 
put that story aside because they, according to them, it makes Jesus look a little foolish. But no, there's great wisdom in it. So the fact is that one person having done it, we can all do it. And we have to have faith in ourselves. So what is this faith? Faith in ourselves. Faith in the teacher. Faith in God. Faith in nature and the universe. And all of this amounts to the same thing, actually. Because yourself in depth is the same as nature. It's the same as what we call God. It's the same as all of these things. It's only one entity. And that has to be our conviction. We solve all our problems when we see things from a holistic point of view. Now, of course, if there's uh, somebody who is particularly troublesome, then another way of playing the game is to use your imagination because imagination is a powerful thought movement. Introduce them into your meditation. And with all the capacity of your creative imagination, put them on a golden throne and see the divinity there and express it there in a, in a worshipful way in your imagination, putting garlands around their neck, offering flowers, seeing the seeing through their eyes the very divinity shining through. And then the next time you see them in the waking world as a physical entity, you have rehearsed the way you see them previously. And what you'll notice is that there are no divisions anywhere. And having brought that out and meditated on it, let's say in the morning and every day, you'll fall, there's no question that there will be a transformation in the person. You're not doing it for that reason. And that is the key to spiritual healing. When you see God in your enemy, or when you see God in a person who is physically defective or mentally unbalanced, and see there the perfection, nothing to be corrected, then a correction takes place and everybody says, oh, this is miraculous healing. Nothing miraculous about it. It's the way you saw it. It's extremely, uh, well, it's penetrative, but it's also, when you see perfection there, perfection comes through. If you see faults there, faults come through. <laughs> if you see defects there, defects come through. If you see then sorrow there, sorrow comes through. Conversely, if you see joy there, joy comes through. If you see love there, love comes through. Whatever you think of will come through. This world is just a configuration of whatever came from the mind. And there's only one mind, one cosmic mind. One question that uh, somebody gave last night, I heard about uh, collective consciousness, what does it mean? So I said, that's not what you think it means. You go to a supermarket, you collect a whole lot of goods, you know, you collect butter and bread and jam and whatever you require, milk and so on. Well, it's not collection, collectivity in that sense. And it's a phrase used by Carl Jung. And what he meant was, there's only one consciousness. There's only one energy. There's only one consciousness. There's only one divine and divinity. And the world is not separate from it. The one side of it is Lila. The other side of it is Nitya. And the one side is the expression of the other. There are no two. There is only God. And we can think of it as that divinity inside every being, every person, every place, every event. And that has to develop more into, yes, I see that as divine grace flowing through it. And then as it, as it, there's nothing else except it. And ultimately beyond it. That's the process. Well, I hope I've answered your various questions. I'm not saying it's easy. If it was easy, it wouldn't be a worthwhile game playing, by the way.
But if you don't take it as a game, then you're in trouble, I think. So, Swami, namaste. Um, so, so if if we take it as a game, okay. So I, I mean, I take it as a game because I did as well some study in game theory, and in the game theory, that's what we see. There are different options, and options are given, and and based on the different options, people have different, um, yeah, different choice to be made. So that's the game theory. That's as well the economical game theory. This learned in, in universities. So based on this, if we take it as a game, because yeah, I do realize that it's, it's, a, it's a Maya, it's simulation, it's a game. So therefore, what steps should um, a servant or a or devotee do, knowing that this is a game, as you mentioned, Then what you do is you make it a loving game, lover and the beloved. You make it a, an interactive partnership game with your most beloved. And you play the game together. The game of love. That's what you do. Yeah, I agree. Like in the Bhagavad Gita, it said as well, no passion. Love, okay, empathy, empathy, yes, but not physical love, more platonic love. Like in a sense, I mean, in my mind, it's more platonic love, not, you know, it's, you know, it doesn't need to be obviously sexual in some sense. You know, it's it needs to be platonic, you know, like love is, because love is, is, is emotion and my emotion is something that is obviously something that is sometimes can be irrational empathy you see, you, see, you see there are very people who understand the subject of love because uh, we use this word love for many many different things and uh, they, they recently we know that a uh, pope benedict passed away he gave a beautiful beautiful um, essay on this caritas this love distinguishing eros for example and uh, passion and so and Swami Vivekananda gives us beautiful definition of love is a three cornered thing. Most human love is love of your own self. It's intrinsically selfish. But Swami Vivekananda puts down some criteria that uh, there's no fear in it, there's no rival in it, and there's no reward in it. All that selfishness is taken away by this definition. And when we say God is love, it means that's exactly it. God is not looking for a reward, nor is he looking to punish you or anything like that, nor is he looking for, nor is there any rival to that anywhere. And I think uh, I quoted this text to somebody a few days ago or a few weeks ago maybe, and you may recognize it. Love is patient, love is kind. It's not jealous, it's not pompous, it's not inflated, it's not rude. It doesn't seek its own interests. It's not quick-tempered. It doesn't brood over injury. It doesn't rejoice over wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Now, you may recognize this as a quotation from one of the epistles or letters of St. Paul. And I think at every marriage ceremony, as I understand it, this is part and parcel of what uh, what a priest says in terms of this, you know. So I think we have to understand what this love means, you know. And unfortunately, we use the same word for so many things. There are some people who love chocolate, you know. There are some people, some people who you know love shoes, and there are some people who, you know. And the genetic love is there with every animal. Every animal loves their own species. The reason why we dogs are good at safeguarding yourself and your property is because it protects its own territory and protects its own young, protects its own. Well, anybody can have genetic love. And that's not the kind of elevated sense of love we're talking about. And it expresses itself in many different ways. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you, Swamiji. Oh.